we're talking about game changers because we're talking about statements that Jesus gave during his ministry that were countercultural, they were radical, and they were most of all were unheard of. People didn't say the things that Jesus said. And this week we look at the idea of counting the cost and what it means to count the cost. And this is a pretty significant piece of scripture here from Jesus in Luke 14. I'm going to read it all right now, and then we'll kind of talk about it a little bit. If you follow along with me, it says that large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, verse 27 is familiar because we talked about it four weeks ago, not about 27, but we talked about it in another setting where Jesus said those very same words. And then he says this in verse 28, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him who has 20,000? If, if he is not able, then he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So he's talking about counting the cost here. What does it mean to, to count the cost? We think about that all the time in our life, in our daily life. We think we count the cost on lots of things. For instance, when you go to buy a house, do you count the cost? Well, I hope you do, because if you don't, then you might get surprised you know, in some way or another. We got a surprise last week, and I don't know, it must be why we live where we live, but our house payment went up $275. Yeah. And like, gosh, what? So it's like, what was that? Well, I think it's taxes uh, that jumped way up high and a little bit of insurance mostly. But, you know, I'm thinking about that and how am I going to handle that and what are we going to do to adjust and all that stuff. I'm counting the cost. That's what it means. If you make medical decisions, often you're asked to decide maybe on some kind of long-term treatment and you have to count the cost. And a lot of times we do. And often what we do is we decide between what is the quantity of life versus the quality of life, right? And a lot of times there's hard decisions that are being made there. Now, recently I experienced something that was kind of different for me. I decided to go shopping. And I went by myself, which is kind of a scary moment. I imagine when I texted that to Pam that she had some horrifying thoughts, you know, for sure. But I had to buy a pair of jeans. I wanted to buy a pair of jeans. And so I went to a store where I buy jeans and went in. And the first thing, person's right there, what can I do to help with you with? And, and I said, well, I want to buy some jeans. And I'm kind of the shopper that says, show me the pair and I'm going to get out, okay? You don't try to upsell me. I don't need vests. I don't need shirts. I just want a pair of jeans. That's all I want, a pair of jeans. And so he brought some to me, and I tried them on, and I didn't like them very much. So he said, I, I know what you need. And he brought another pair to me, and, man, they felt so good. They just fit this body so nice. And that's hard to come by, you know. And so I thought, well, okay, I think I got my jeans. And then I said, but you're going to have to take four inches off the leg in order for me to have this because they, they don't make jeans with short people legs. And I got short people legs. And so we had to hem them. And so he got me up on that thing and he muddied around on it and turned up the cuffs and everything, started to mark the pants and he marked the pants. And all of a sudden there was this thought in my mind, I don't know how much these jeans cost. I had never thought about that for this experience. And so I looked at the guy and said, stop, I need to know how much these jeans cost. And he said, well, let me look at the tag. And he looks at the tag, 
And he says, they're $115. (laughs) I mean, to tell you what, I about jumped right out of that store. I just thought, what? And I looked at him and I said, there is no way I'm buying jeans for $115, period. You got to find me something else. And he looked at me like, these are going to fit perfect and they're so nice and all that kind of stuff. I said, no, I'm not spending $115. So he went and got another pair of jeans and um, they were $55. Listen, the $55 jeans look just as good as the $115 jeans and they fit good and he still had to hem them up and everything. But I got to tell you, I'm really glad I counted the cost because I would have had some splaining to do at home if it was 115 bucks, right? And so we all have to think that way, don't we? I, he wanted to sell me these $115 jeans, and I think he was pretty pumped for a minute, and then it was like, oh, $55. So that's the kind of experience that we have with, with this kind of game-changing idea of counting the cost. What we see here is, is that Jesus is doing something that's really significant that he does all the time in his ministry that we don't do in the 21st century time at all now. He's trying to turn crowds away rather than invite crowds in. And it says there in verse 25, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said. Now this is what Jesus did a lot of because there were so many people, thousands and thousands of people that were following Jesus and they would just kind of go as a group, and they would pick up more and more people, and eventually he had all these thousands of people, but they weren't there for the right reason. They were there to see a miracle happen. They were there to hear some kind of teaching, and maybe it would be radical enough that there'd be an argument between the teachers of the law and Jesus. They were there for the show, and Jesus is saying, we need to stop this right now. And in this day and age, in the 2019, most churches are, have opened up their doors and said, whatever we can do to get them in, no matter what it is, okay? And that includes, you know, we, we did an Easter egg hunt because we're trying to reach the community and do some things with them and love on them. I love now that the Easter egg hunt has been replaced with the Easter egg drop from helicopters. And uh, all these churches now are doing these helicopter drops. And you can pay thousands of dollars to have this guy come drive, fly over you and drop the eggs right there, and then the kids scatter like little ants and that kind of stuff. And a lot of churches are doing that stuff. You know, a lot of churches really are resorting to gimmicks to try to get people in. And while I can appreciate the fact that they want more people to come, you win people. What you win people with is what you win people to. And it ends up being that you have another story that has to happen and another great thing that has to happen and you end up chasing chasing you behind on it you know all the time forever so here's Jesus who says I need to thin out this crowd a little bit and he's going to talk about counting the cost and I want you to know that what Jesus was concerned about more than anything was the quality of the disciple not the quantity okay He didn't get all excited about the numbers and all that stuff. He wanted to know if people had the right attitude and could actually follow him. And so one person wrote these words. In this passage, Jesus calls people to a kind of discipleship that is not cheap, not easy, and not to be entered into without deep consideration of the consequences or the costs. This passage speaks to the importance of loyalty and allegiance to Jesus over all other competing loyalties, including family, self-interest, and possessions. The bottom line, what Jesus is asking us to consider and them to consider in the first century is, do you count what the cost is before you come and follow me? And so he does this with a couple kind of uh, hyperbole statements, and, and then he uses a couple parables along the way. First, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and his brother and sister, wife and children, even their own life, they can't not be my disciple. And we read those words and we see that word hate there and we think, what is he saying? Well, I think he's really talking in hyperbole. What he's really saying is, I just need you to know that if you're going to follow me, I'm going to be on the throne of your life and I'm going to be in first place. First place. And you need to get that worked out in your own mind. Because if you're really going to be my disciple, I need to be first place. 
in the whole hierarchy in your life. And he kind of says it that way with hate your father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters because he wants to get their attention. There's a cost here. And the cost is that you have to hate your mother. You have to make sure that I, Jesus, am in front of everybody else, that I'm first in your life. And, you know, that's a, that's a challenge, isn't it? I know uh, 40 years ago when I became a Christian, uh, one of the things that I had to deal with was what kind of impact would this decision have with my family? And uh, when I finally told them that I was baptized and became a believer, my, my parents, they weren't really very happy about that at all. And as a matter of fact, they were upset. They thought maybe it was a cult kind of thing that I was involved in. And it took years for me to love them and love them and love them and not get mad at them, but to say that my decision to follow Jesus is my first loyalty in my life. doesn't mean I don't love you. I do love you, and I have loved them, but Jesus is first. And that's how you got to count the cost. So the first thing he says here is, is you got to define your relationships. you got to define your relationships. Jesus shocks people with the word hate here, and what Jesus was doing was establishing a priority for those who must follow him. And that is this. He must be first. He must be first. Now that doesn't mean you neglect your parents or neglect your brothers and sisters or your wife. And there's plenty of scripture to talk about how Christians would treat their family members and they'll do the best they can. It's not a bad thing at all. But we have to make sure that we prioritize our relationships. That's essential. And there is room for honoring and loving family as a disciple of Christ. But it must become behind the priority of loving Jesus first. That's really important. And then Jesus decides, or talks about, determine if you can finish. And that's what he's talking about here with the tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Now that's common sense, isn't it? But it happens, doesn't it, that people start things and then don't finish it because they didn't count the cost. For instance, up on the screen, you're going to see uh, a, uh, a foundation. It's right by my house. It's been that way for about two and a half months. No work's been done on it at all. I imagine it will eventually get done. But it reminded me of a, of a foundation where I was growing up in a valley where it was just like that. And it sat there for like eight years. And you know what? Every time you drive by, you know what you think? You think somebody didn't count the cost, and they got caught somehow. And eventually, somebody came along and bought the property and then decided to, to build the house on there. But for about eight years, it was just that little foundation that was there. And uh, that causes people to question what you're doing. So you have to determine if you can finish. Now, it may be a house, or it may be a race. Last week was the Oklahoma City Marathon. And uh, I'm always amazed at all the things that people overcome to be able to run in that race, whether it's the full marathon or the half or the 5K. There, there's one thing that everyone wants to do. They want to finish. I mean, even if they don't get their personal record or if they don't hit a certain time, everyone in that race just wants to cross the finish line. And it sure feels good when you can do it. I know that I ran a, thir a 10K when I was, uh, right after I'd had my stroke, it was about a year afterwards, it was part of my therapy, and I ran that thing, and my, my daughter ran it too, and she ran ahead of me and finished about 10 minutes ahead of me, and so she ran back to run with me to make sure that I finished the race. And it was really a special moment for us, because I'm not sure I would have finished it, really, but then she's there telling me, you better finish this race. It's like, okay, I guess I'll try to finish it, and I did. So... I just want you to know that you, everyone has to determine when you come, become a Christian, can you finish? Here's the thing I want you to see. Jesus is more interested in who crosses the finish line than who starts at the starting line. Okay? And there are always going to be people, aren't there, that are going to start and not finish. How, how does Jesus characterize this in his ministry? He talks about the narrow way and the broad way. And lots of people are going to get on the broad way because it looks easier and it looks better and there's all kinds of people there. But Jesus says the ones that are going to really get the reward in their life are going to be the ones who go through the narrow way and finish the 
race. That's what it means to count the cost. So a good question for me to ask all of us, whether you're young or old or anything in between, is are you on a course that you are confident that you can finish? That you can finish. I mean, is that your desire, to finish the race? And I think today, this morning, we've got Marguerite Williams here. Marguerite, why don't you wave to everybody? And it's just great to have you here today. And uh, Mary, you're, you too. And of course, Marguerite is Ira's uh, wife and Mary's daughter to Ira and Marguerite, who passed away. Ira did a couple weeks ago. And you know, I thought a lot about this this week with you, Marguerite. I thought about how Ira finished the race. He finished the race. And up until his very last days, even in his last days, he was still talking about Jesus and about his faith in Jesus. And I think that's awesome. Now, if you think that's a short race, you know the story about Ira and Marguerite. They've been believers for a long, long, long time, decades. And yet, there he was at the finish line. And who was there with the finish line with him? Jesus. Because he cares about the people that finish. And that's the most important thing in his mind. So I want to ask you today, do you have a course set out with Jesus that you are confident that you can finish? Because you have to finish. And uh, that race happens in our life all the time. And I really think that God is much more interested in those who finish than those who start and walk off at all. And that doesn't mean he doesn't love a person that walks off, but ultimately he wants people to finish the race. So I think that's uh, really important. This third thing, and I'll kind of wrap it up here this morning with this, is you have to develop your plan for success. Develop your plan for success. He's talking about a king here in verse 31. And this king, he, would, he needs to sit down if he's going to go to war. He's got to calculate how much army he has and how much army they have and decide whether or not it's going to be a successful run. And if it's not, then what does he do? Jesus says he would send somebody way out in advance of the battle zone and try to negotiate a peace, a treaty, of some sort, which is smart, especially if you're outmanned in your, in your battle. And so he's talking there about dealing with this idea of developing a plan for success. And I think all of us can do that. We need to look at where the hot spots are in our life and how are we going to make sure that Jesus stays number one in our life, even when we're asked to maybe sacrifice that in some way or another. We don't want to do that. And so we need to develop that plan. I think the emphasis here is, is that Jesus is saying that when you make big decisions, you need to look at the pros and cons and develop a plan and count the cost and make sure you're making the right decision. So for each of us, there are moments when we have to count the cost of following Jesus. And we should take the words of Jesus ser seriously. We need to prioritize our relationships. We need to make sure we intend to finish and we need to have a plan that is well thought out that will allow us to be successful with our life in Jesus. Now, I didn't say this up front, but I'll say it now because it's in your notes, that we have to count the cost personally for all of us. That's very important. All of us have to do that. And nobody can do that for you. You have to count the cost as to what it means to follow Jesus. But we also have to count the cost corporately, too which means as a church. And so as a church, we're constantly thinking about things and trying to figure out how we can do things better and what needs to happen at this season of our, our life. And corporately, it's very important. And so I'm going to ask Ken Murphy to come up and talk to us about counting the cost corporately, okay, as a church. And this is for the whole church. And he's going to have some exciting things to share with you. And then I'll come back and wrap it up. Now, I'm not... I'm not a smooth, engaging, professional speaker like our man Charlie here. <laughs> but um, I, I tell you that because I, I don't want you to let the, the delivery distract from the message. Uh, I may refer to my notes a whole lot more than he does, but stay engaged with the message because it's, it's important. The things that um, we're going to talk about today is a... It's not a final step, but it is definitely a next big step that we're looking to take here. And I don't want to overstate this, 
but we've been preparing for today now for about the last three years. When we started Warzone, uh, almost three years ago, uh, we did probably the only outreach program in history that had nothing to do with outreach. But what we were looking to do was we were trying to get us kind of off of our bottoms in here and out into the community. If we reached people while we were there, that was great. But the real goal was to teach us to get out of the church building and take the church out into the community. And, and quite frankly, it was, it was really successful. And then about a year and a half ago, we started Warzone 2.0 which actually had more of an outreach component for us because at that time, we were now out and about into the community. We were trained. We were ready to go. And so we began doing more and more outreach. And honestly, we are more into the community, and our community knows us better now than it has in, in any time that I can remember. And some of that has been things like the Higher Grounds Coffee Shop. Uh, how many of you have kind of poured into that shop over the last two or three years? And as a result of that, we all have our, our Michaels in the community that we got to know. Uh, and every one of you that have been over there, there's probably a name that could go along with that, of people in the community that you have been drawn to, that you've been able to deal with. Uh, our ladies that go up to Rollingwood, uh, I promise you, that school, that school knows who Cherokee Hills Christian Church is and knows what we're about and who we serve. Everyone in that school does. Uh, think about the Putnam City football team. Do you think they know who Cherokee Hills Christian Church is? I, I, I guarantee you they do. We've had baskets that we've taken out to people that have moved into the community. Uh, we've got neighborhood associations that now meet inside our facility. We've had the Christmas tree lighting that we do every year. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but we don't contact them and ask them if we can do that. The city of War Acres calls us and asks, will you do it? Because they now know that we're committed to this community and that we're involved. And if we do it, we'll do it well and do it right and do it in a way that, that frankly, Jesus would be proud of. And so we do that kind of stuff. We have a, a preschool now that is more outreach oriented than it has ever been. And again, that's, that's a testament to you guys that are pouring into that preschool. We have a sign that's out here on the street and that sign gets the attention literally of every car that drives past and there's a lot of them that go past every day. And so we are known in this community now better than it has been in a long, long time. But now that we're known, people are starting to find their way into our building. Uh, as I said, we've had people that have, uh, that their homeowners associations are there. We have visitors uh, literally every week. And so as we prepare to reap the fruits of the outreach that we've done, we need to get our facility into better shape. Um, it needs to be inviting. It needs to be warm. It needs to be welcoming. And this isn't just about the ministry that we're doing today. We've got to begin today preparing for the ministry that we're going to do for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, we've got to have a building that is safe and secure. In, in today's environment, and it's, it's, it's pitiful that we have to talk about this, we've got to have a safe and secure building for people to come to. That, we, that people are comfortable dropping their children off in our children's area. Uh, that they're comfortable allowing their, their high schoolers and middle schoolers to go upstairs. We've got we've to look into that. And that's something that, frankly, in the past hasn't been that big of a priority. But it is today. Uh, people have got to be really comfortable bringing their, their, their kids here. Now, a lot of you that have been in the home that you're in for 10, 15, 20 years you know there comes a time where you've got to do some maintenance, uh, where you've got to begin kind of putting things together. And it could be that you are going to put some paint on the wall. Uh, you might be putting in new flooring or new carpets. Uh, you might be changing up what you're doing on the, uh, uh, your wall coverings. And you might even be moving some walls around 
uh, to take better use of the, of the property that you have. But whatever it is, you'll do it if you've been there 15 or so years. Uh, that's just what you do. Yeah, you don't have to. I mean, you could let it continue to deteriorate, but it just looks better, it feels better, and when you have visitors in your home, you feel better about having them there. Um, that's where we kind of find ourselves as a church right now. Um, mostly outside of this auditorium, but, but some in here. Uh, if you kind of look around, uh, you'll find that we've allowed our building to deteriorate a little bit, or maybe a lot. Uh, we've got some structural issues. If you've ever been in one of these classrooms back here during a rainstorm, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you'll have trash cans sitting around the room catching drips, and uh, we've got holes in the walls pretty much anywhere that you walk in the building, you'll see them. Um, we've got stains in our carpet. Can I get an amen on that one? Uh, <laughs> let me just, just look around you. Uh, some of you know where the stains are because you put them there. Uh, but... but uh, but we've got, you know, paint schemes in the building that just, frankly, are, are outdated. Uh, and we've got uh, some security issues, uh, especially in our, in our children's area. There's just a lot of work that needs to be done that, that we've put off uh, until now. And so what we want to do, and uh, what I want to kind of invite you or maybe even challenge you to do, it's just for a minute, I want you to take off that member's hat that you're wearing and put on a first-time visitor's hat, okay? Because when you're a member and you come here every Sunday, it's kind of like those holes in the wall. You just sort of start walking past them because they're there every Sunday and you don't even notice them. But if you're a first-time visitor that walks in, you're, you're going to see that. Uh, and so what I want you to do is when church is over today or sometime in the next week or so, I want you to just take a stroll around the building. Uh, go to places that you don't normally go. And I want you to look at the ceiling tiles. And I want you to look at the carpets. And whenever you're coming in and out of the parking lot out there, look at the flower beds. Um, you know, just look at the, the things that are on our walls. And just look at them as though it's the first time you've ever looked at them. And see what you think. Uh, what we've done is we have kind of allowed our building to wear out. And we've allowed it to get outdated. Um, a, less, a less kinder way of putting it is it just looks old and tired and worn out. Uh, now, I know for a fact that's not who we are as a church. And it's definitely not what we've been telling the community for the last three years. And what I don't want is I don't want our building sending a message that is not who we are and sending that before we get an opportunity to tell people and show people what we're about and who we serve. And as people will walk into a building, we're not going to get a second chance a lot of times. And so we've got to prepare ourselves for that. Now, a lot of you may be a lot like me, and you don't spend a whole lot of time back in our children's area. Okay, And if you don't get back there very often, you really don't know what it looks like. Um, if you were to walk back there right now, I just want to show you a few pictures of, of, of what that might look like. Um, these are just some, and we'll kind of scroll through these, but notice the, the, the chair with, with nothing on the back and, and the table. And go ahead and scroll, scroll through them, and let's just kind of see. And I didn't set anything up. I just took a walk through there and, and, and snapped some pictures as I was going of the chairs and the, uh, the, the tables and kind of what the walls look like. But, you know, when you go in there Sunday after Sunday, things like that, you just get used to seeing them. Some of the paint schemes that are on the walls, they looked awesome back in the late 90s and 2000. They really did. And when we put them up, they looked great. But if, 
if anybody's keeping count, the late 90s was somewhere around 20 plus years ago. <laughs> and we haven't changed a whole lot. And what we have is, is getting marked up and beat up. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, you know, the, we, we, it's just old and worn out and tired. Uh, now, stay on this picture just for a minute. Okay, this is the back side of the children's area. Everybody checks the kids in over here, and they get their name tags, and they get, and, and we've got some good things security-wise that are going on, but this is the back side that comes into our children's area, and there's nothing that protects it. So anyone could walk into there completely undetected. Now, I will tell you, before we all rush out of here and go grab our kids, our, our staff is doing a phenomenal job. We've got doors that lock on, on the outside, and we're working the security side of it. We have people that are aware and everything, but we've got to give them better tools to work with. And what, you know, looking right there, being able to secure that, and, we, and we'll talk about that more here in just a minute. But, but that's kind of the state of our children's area. And guys, we can't, we can't do that. Uh, we can't have it looking like this. Um, one, of the, one of the questions, though, that, that I want to ask is, can we, can we continue to do the ministry that we're set here to do and allow our facility to kind of drop down around us? So what we are wanting to do is begin a campaign to upgrade our facility. Uh, we're taking steps towards that. We're at the very early beginning stages of it. But what we want to make certain is that everyone is up to date. Everybody knows what, where we're going, what direction we're looking at. Uh, we've been kind of building to this point for a long time. Uh, but as we kind of go forward, we want everybody to know the direction we're going. So what if we're going to count the cost of what we're doing, we kind of need to know the direction that we're moving. And so let me kind of just give you a brief overview of some of the things that we're talking about. If you start on the far north end over here, we're talking about resurfacing and restriping that parking lot. Um, it is time. Uh, it's, it's hard to find, find the lines. It's, it's getting cracks in it. When you start getting cracks, it's going to deteriorate, which just makes it worse and worse. Uh, we're talking about revamping the flower beds and the exterior of the front entrance over here. Uh, if you drive past them all the time, stop and look at, a, at some of the beds on that north side. They, they don't scream inviting and warm and, 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 and somebody that has put a priority into that. Uh, this front entrance over here, adding some things like just some, some stone veneer to the front and maybe around the pot white posts out there, just making it look newer. Uh, remodeling this front lobby uh, of completely changing out the, the, the flooring in there and getting some paint on it and adding where this A1 classroom is over here a welcome kind of a coffee bar area with a uh, a bar and some bar stools and some tables and the uh, computer hookup thingies. Um, and, and we will have someone younger than me uh, orchestrating the computer hookup thingies. <laughs> but, uh, but having that over there as something that will be a place to meet and greet and be able to use at other times other than just when we're coming in and out of the front door. Uh, we want to... Um, Overhaul the south entrance over here. Uh, bring it into this century. Uh, we're going to widen it by getting rid of the coat rack and the shelves. We'll add new floors, uh, more energy efficient doors uh, to make that a more welcoming reception area. Uh, we're going to do our best to find what it is that's leaking. Uh, frankly, that's been an ongoing how do we find it, but we're going to do our best to find what's leaking out there and, and fix it so that maybe, just maybe, we won't have to have the trash cans as part of our decor. Uh, we're going to 
expand and make a much easier handicap entrance coming out of the south parking lot over here with a, with a covered awning so that we can pull in underneath that out of the weather and make that entrance into the church for uh, a handicap area much easier and better. And then we're going to do a massive makeover in the children's area. And that will include, um, can we put that very last picture back up? Yeah, that's going to include somewhere in the vicinity of where that air conditioning vent is there on the floor, uh, having a wall go across there, probably a glass wall with a door that will lock, and then that will completely secure our children's area from both sides. Uh, we'll have a, a, a door there, and then we have three of our children's classrooms that open up into the main hallway, uh, right, at, right out here and then one right around here. Their doors open up into the hallway. We're going to wall those off, those doors, and then install doors on the opposite wall so that then those classrooms will open into this secured children's area. And now we have a lot better control of what we're working with there, uh, not counting the kids, but the... <laughs> but so that, that will be part of the, of the children's work. We are going to um, completely remodel both of the bathrooms back on that side. And if you have not been in those bathrooms in a while, you're missing a treat. Uh, <laughs> But, but those will both be remodeled. We are going in the children's area, there'll be new flooring, new paint, new furniture, uh, new storage, just way better. Um, in the, uh, um, oh, and we will also put in a security wall and door on this side as well so that we can get our children's check-in out of the lobby area. Uh, we can move it up into the children's area and just make that, again, a lot more efficient, a lot easier for parents to be able to navigate and, and know what they're doing. Uh, in here, there will be improved lighting and acoustics. Uh, throughout the hallways, there will be new flooring and paint and um, other things uh, as, as they come along. And quite frankly, this is, this is literally just an overview of, of what we're trying to look at. Uh, now, here's, here's a thought. Can we love on kids and teach them about Jesus without doing all of this? It's a fair question. And the answer is yes, we can. Because, I know that, because we literally do it every Sunday, right now. Okay, but, but here's the rub with that. When parents are bringing new kids in, I mean, that's awesome for the kids that we have now, but when parents are bringing new kids in, when we have visitors that are coming in and they see a tired, old building, when they see a building that they might perceive that the security is not up to par, they're not going to stay here long enough for us to be able to love on them. They're not going to stay here long enough for us to be able to teach them about Jesus. They're going to come in and do a lot of what they're doing right now, here for a Sunday, maybe two, and then, and then moving on. Okay. Our job, one of our jobs, is to reach our community with the love of Jesus Christ. This building is a tool that God has given us to use. We've got to bring it in, into this decade. Uh, we've got to preserve it. We've got to preserve the building that we have and we've also got to prepare for the next 10 or 15 years of ministry. We can't just look at today. We've got to look at the next 10 or 15 years. And so doing all of this is just part of work that must be done. Now, a lot of this is going to be done in the year 2020. Uh, as we raise the funds for it, as we have the money, we will do that. Okay, but some of it is, is too urgent. Some of it has to be done literally now. Now, I don't know if any of you saw this past week, but we had two cranes out here in the front parking lot. And I realized this is kind of a guy thing, but there was these two massive cranes. There were two other trucks. There were guys on the roof. There were guys, it was so cool. Y'all aren't enjoying it as much as I did, but it was, it was so cool. 
But they were, what they were doing was removing an old air conditioning unit that had quit working. They were getting it off, putting another one on. If you've been a little colder the last week or so, it's because we have an air conditioning unit that's actually working. And we added Freon and service to all of the other units. Are you all aware that we have 23 air conditioning units? 23 of them. And we've been replacing one or two a year for the last several years. Uh, just That's just what you have to do on a facility this age. Uh, but this was something that had to get done. To replace that one unit was $15,000. Okay, it's not cheap. I mean, you know that as you are working on things at home. Uh, but we had to do that, and so we went ahead and got it done. The other part that we think is urgent and we need to get started on it like now, is the work in our children's area. Okay, the, the remodel and the reworking and the construction that we're gonna do in there, we hope to be doing that all through 2019, through this year. We are committed to our children, and we've said this multiple times, that our children and our youth are our priority. And this is something that we are showing, and if you remember, in, in Charlie's sermon from last week, you remember the statistic that he gave? 96% of people that it, it come to Christ do it before age 18. 96%, I'm sorry, 94%, 94%. And so that has to be a priority for us. And beginning the work on our children's area is something that, that we need to get done now. But before we can begin construction, uh, before we can get permits, and even before we can come up with here's what it's going to cost, we've got to have architectural drawings and plans and, and everything that kind of puts all of this onto blueprints so that we can begin engineering it and, and going from there. And for a lack of a better way of putting that, these things aren't cheap. Okay? To get an architect to come in and evaluate all of the work that we've already done and what we're looking at doing the cost for those architectural fees are $60,700. Yeah, it's not cheap. Uh, but, frankly, you can't get permits, you can't do anything without that. And so for the, for the size of a facility that we have and for the amount of work that we're doing, that's going to be the cost. Uh, now, we have a family within our church that is so committed to this work and is so committed to this church and to the ministry that we are doing in this community, they've agreed to pay 50% of that. So what that means is that we, as a church, need to raise the remaining 50%, which would be $30,350. Uh, once we have that, we can kind of get this ball rolling, and we can get, we can get uh, moving down, learning what all we need to do, what it's going to cost, and go. So here's what our plan is. On Sunday... June the 2nd, so roughly a month from now, uh, we're going to have a step offering. And for those of you that may or not know what a, what a step offering is, it's something that we've done for many years here. A step offering is where we have one item that, that needs to be taken care of, and it has ranged from someone that may need uh, help with their rent or utilities, it could be uh, they have a car that's broken down. Uh, sometimes we're able to say, here's what it is. Sometimes it's just a confidential thing, and we just say, we need this. And, uh, but what we're going to do is, uh, and then people give that, they bring it up and put the money on the steps. It's, it's kind of above and beyond our normal offering, uh, but at a point in the service, we'll just say, now's the time, and everybody will come up and drop some money off on the front. And God has been absolutely amazing with this over the years. Uh, I literally cannot think of a single time in all the years that we've done that that the need hasn't been met, ever. Uh, God is so faithful, and you guys are so generous. And so on June the 2nd, we're going to have a step offering to raise the remaining $30,350. I can tell you that no gift will be too large. And no gift will be too small. It takes all of us to, to, to accomplish this. And what we will do is um, 
take those funds. If we get more than we need, then that money will roll right over and begin funding the work in our children's area. Uh, so as soon as we have that, we will, we will get started. Uh, I don't say this as just an ending. I, I mean it. These are exciting times at Cherokee Hills Christian Church. We've got a lot going for us right now, and God is pleased with the work that we're doing. And we feel like that we are following his will and his plan as we go forward with this. So thank you. So the idea is we count the cost personally and corporately, okay? And uh, we all have to do the personal stuff ourselves, but every once in a while we need to corporately, together as a family, say this is something God's leading us to do. I will tell you we've had a team working on this since January of 2018, okay, and has done lots of work to, to identify where the issues are and stuff like that. And so that team plus the elders have been working on it, and this is where we've ended up. So I want to invite you to, to pray and to be ready on the second to bring whatever gift God leads you to and put it on the steps, and we'll see God do some amazing things with that, okay? So why don't you stand up? I don't have a band here, but that's okay. Go ahead and stand up, and uh, I'm going to pray and dismiss us, okay? And, uh, and I hope you'll, if you've got questions, you can talk to me. You can't talk to Ken because he's leaving the country for the next two weeks. <laughs> but you can talk to me or uh, Phil. Uh, I don't know, it's me and Phil pretty much, it looks like. So I think the rest of the elders are gone. So, uh, but any questions, we'll try to answer and, uh, and put that out there for you. Okay, let's pray together. Our God, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for how you carry us through seasons um, that are hard, but also seasons that are good. And right now in the life of this church, this is a season that is good. And yet it also presents us, God, with challenges and opportunities um, to see you work through us in, in the work of your church. So we pray for your blessing on this offering, and we pray, God, that you would help us all to count the cost in following you primarily and make sure we're right with you uh, but then corporately that we count the cost together as we look at this. We thank you for those who uh, believe in this, and we pray that you would use all of us to um, be used to, to further your kingdom and to get our building up to par here. And we want to honor you with that too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.